So welcome to unit C, which is about filtering. So as you remember, we started by looking at two trajectories. The red one, which we obtained by an additional external measurement system and not by the sensors that are available for the robot itself. And the blue one, which we obtained by reading out the wheel counters of the robot and applying a motion model. And we saw the following problem. As long as the robot goes straight, everything seems fine. But then when the robot turns, the two trajectories diverge. And we found out that the reason is probably a wrong calibration constant, namely the width of the robot. So we experimented a little bit with that calibration parameter, but we found out we can somehow improve it. But nevertheless, if we just rely on the measurements of our wheel counters, there will always be a drift that leads to a situation that we are in the end far away from the correct position. So we came up with the following idea. In addition to the wheel counters, we are also using the information that we get from our laser scanner. So the laser scanner sees all those cylinders and can determine the position. And by using an assignment of those cylinders to the known cylinders in the real world, which are stored as a kind of a map, we can correct the robot's position. And as we see everywhere, we do have some smaller or larger jumps in the trajectory. Nevertheless, we ended up in a globally good looking trajectory. And we can distinguish two different effects here. In one case, if our reference trajectory looks like that, and our reconstructed trajectory looks like that, then the difference that we see here is most probably not due to noise. Rather, it is due to a wrong parameter in our movement model. And so this is called a systematic effect or systematic error. If on the other hand, our reference looks like that and our estimated trajectory looks somehow like that, then we also have differences between those two. But those differences are most probably due to a random error. Now keeping those two apart in modeling is not as easy as it seems. So in our case, in order to fix that systematic error, we already had an approach, namely to use another parameter for the robot's width. So we can use or add a calibration parameter. But then the world is more complex than you would think. Namely, in our case, we fixed it by setting the width to a higher value. This was somehow unusual because I measured the width of the robot. But in the end, we obtained a good trajectory by setting it just to a different width, which didn't make much sense. And the reason for that is probably that when our caterpillar robot turns, there is a large slip between the caterpillar tracks and the ground. Now we can set a calibration parameter like W2 here and all works fine. But then later, when we put the robot on a different ground, it may behave differently and the output may be something like that. And so while we may be able to solve that problem in our case, in general, the underlying problem is always every modeling will be incomplete. So then the usual approach is you try to capture the most important effects of the real world in your model of the system and the rest of them are handled as random errors. And so the hope is just that the effect of this remaining systematic error that can't be modeled can be neglected. So next let's have a look at the random error. First let's have a look at the movement. So say this is our ground and our robot moves in a one-dimensional fashion to the left or right. So in the beginning, we're absolutely sure that our robot is at the position zero meters. And then we tell him to move for one meter, please. So that's a command. And then the robot ends up here. It also changes shape, but never mind. So then it is here at one meter. And then we tell the robot again to move for one meter. So it ends up here, pops back to its original shape, and it ends here at two meters. And so far we handled this the following way. We said we are absolutely sure that we are at zero meters. And then we gave the command, or the control, that the robot shall move for one meter. And so in the end, we are absolutely sure that the robot is in the position one meter. And the same for the movement from one meter to two meters. So meaning we assumed there is no error. But we already noticed that is not really true. Let's see what this means in terms of probabilities. Now say our one dimensional space is rostered into small cells. The robot is only allowed to stay in one of those cells. The x-axis here, that's our position. 
Whereas the y-axis, that's the probability that the robot is at that position. So with our current approach, at time t0, since we are absolutely sure that the robot is at 0 meters, this would mean, say this is the 0 meter cell, that the probability being at 0 meters is 1.0, whereas the probability of being somewhere else is 0, 0.0. And after the robot moves, at t1, it is exactly at 1 meter, and at t2, it is exactly at 2 meters. That was our approach so far, and we saw it didn't work very well. So now let's model the errors. So say again this is our ground, which is subdivided into discrete cells. This is our position x, whereas here is our probability that the robot is at position x. The probability is between 0 and 1. So say at time t0, we are here at 0, 0.0 meters, but this time we're not so sure about that. So we could also be here at 0. 0.01 meters, or here at minus 0. 0.01 meters. But say the probability of being to the left or right of our intended position is half of that of being at the intended position. From that we would say the probability of being at our desired position is 0.5, whereas the probability of being to the left and right is 0.25 each. And so overall this sums up to a probability of 1. And then if the robot moves to the next position, we will move all those cell values accordingly and obtain this. And if it moves once again, we will obtain this. Now this is called a probability distribution. And since our space is discrete, it's a discrete probability distribution. So for every position xi, we have a probability. And this probability must be larger or equal to 0. And it must be smaller or equal to 1. And also, as we did here already, all the probabilities must sum up to 1, where the index runs from minus infinity to plus infinity. Now since this is just a discrete raster, we can represent it in the computer as an array. So we define a certain raster width, say 1 centimeter, so this might be the cell 1 meter, whereas this is 1 meter, 1 centimeter, and this is 99 centimeters, and so on. And with our probabilities up here, we will obtain 0.5 and 0.25 and all the other values will be 0. Now as you can see here, the problem is this area of cells extends to infinity. And so we make use of the fact that every robot will have a limited space where it can operate. And so using this, we will just cut our array at both ends. And so I implemented a class to represent this discrete probability distribution. And what it will do is the following. Instead of storing a large array, it starts to store the first value, which is non-zero. And so in this case, it will just store an array of three values. So this is the values array. And it will also store the offset index, which depends on our chosen raster width. But in our case, that might be 99. And using that class, you are able to represent discrete probability distributions. And so the first function I want you to implement is this move function, where an existing distribution is just moved forward by a given distance. Now let's first have a look at the distribution class, and you will find this class in the package for the unit C. So the distribution class has a constructor, which by default just generates a unit pulse at offset zero. So if you call this just without parameters, it will produce at index zero a unit pulse. And if you want to give it explicitly another handmade distribution, then just call it using d is assigned distribution, say of 99, and then a list. So if you want to do the distribution from the previous example, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and this will give the result 99, 100, 101, 0 0.25, and 0 0.5. But we will see in a moment how we can get that distribution by calling another function. Now the representation function will return a string containing the values. It's sometimes useful to debug, so you can just say print distribution. Start and stop will give you the first offset and the offset one beyond the last valid element, so that you can use directly those values in a range or x range call. Normalize is useful to modify the values in a way that the sum of the values equals 1. So that's useful when you want to construct your own distribution 
you don't have to worry about normalizing constants, you just call in the end this normalize function. Now value returns the value of the distribution and the nice thing is it will return a value for any index, not only the indices which are inside the values array. So if these are your values, right, and your array is just here starting at 99, then you can also ask for 200 and it will automatically return 0.0. Then plot lists, that's a kind of special function. It will return two lists which can be directly used in the matplotlib plot function. And so this was a way to incorporate some helper for plotting the distribution into the distribution class without having to include the matplot library into the distribution.py file. And we will see the usage of that function in a moment. So here are some distributions. So you can construct the unipulse at, at a given center. So the center is also the only cell, which is non-zero in this case. And there's a simple distribution called triangle distribution. And what you need to give here is the center and the half width. And this is meant as follows. So if you give a center of say 10 and a half width of two, then it will produce the maximum value here. And at plus minus two, it will be zero. So half width is just half of the width of the entire distribution. But since this is discrete, you will get a value here, here, and there. And so overall, we will get this distribution that we have used all the time with 0.5 and 0.25. And here you can actually see the standard trick. So in order to set that up easily, I just fill in integer values of the counter into an array, not worrying about the necessary normalization. And then after I did this, I construct a distribution which starts at center minus width plus one because center minus the width is here and those values are always zero. So I don't need to store them. So I'm starting here, I'm storing those values. I give the value array to the distribution and at that time it is not normalized. And then I just call the normalize function. There's also a Gaussian distribution here and we will talk about that later. And here in the end, there is a very useful function that computes the sum of several distributions. So say you're having several distributions, like you have something like that, and a second distribution like that. Then this sum function will compute the sum of both, which may be something like that. But on top it will of course normalize everything so that the sum of all values will be one. And this is not very hard to do, but because we store our distributions with a start index or offset and an array, it's a little bit tricky to figure out the overall length of the resulting array. And so this function does all that for you. And in the end, again, it normalizes the resulting distribution. And this function has two parameters. One is the distributions and you would give them in a list. So you would have the distribution one, distribution two, and so on. And each of those distributions is a distribution object or an instance of the distribution class. And optionally, you can also give some weights. So if you give 3.0 here and 2.0 here, then the distribution one will be weighted by a factor of three and distribution two by a factor of two. And in the end, don't worry, everything is normalized. And so you will obtain the very same result if you set this to 6.0 and this to 4.0. Now here's the first program I want you to implement and this should move a distribution by a given delta. So in the main program I set a list of moves so it's 20 20 20 meaning move three times by 20 to the right and we start at a position but this position is not an integer anymore it's a distribution. So it is the triangle distribution that we have used before consisting of 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.25 centered at 10. And here's the trick with the plot lists. Plot lists is a member function of our distribution class. And what we do here is by giving two arguments 0 to 100, we make sure that we get two lists back, one with x values and one with the y values suitable to be used directly in the plot command. And then we set the line style to steps so that the discrete nature of our plot is shown more clearly. And now we do just a loop for all the moves, our position, which is now distribution, is replaced by the old position moved by the amount of movement from the loop variable. And then again we plot it using the very same command. In the end, 
The y limit is a function of matplotlib and it will set the y maximum just a little bit above 1 in order to make distributions more visible that are exactly 1.0. So we won't need that here. And in the end, all the plots which go into the very same diagram are shown. And if you implement that correctly, you will see the following. A window opens where your original triangle distribution is at position 10. You see the 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and then you move it three times by an amount of 20. So now please program this. 